Then turned into 
chest of some other bronze. Denise kept fighting back, scratching, biting, and kicking Stefani, and he opened the passenger door behind her, which made them both fall out of the car onto the pavement, with Stefani pinning her down. Denise decided to change tactics and play dead, saying, I'm dying, I'm dying, and lying still, but Stefani kept stabbing her regardless, so she started screaming for help. Douglas Panning, a young man who lived near the parking lot, heard the screams and ran over and saw Stefani stabbing Denise, and both of them covered in blood. This part's a little gross, but he also heard the screwdriver make a thud sound as it hit bone, and he saw Denise had the neck of a broken bottle in her hand. Douglas grabbed Stefani's left arm, and Stefani jumped up, stared at Douglas, then came at him with the screwdriver, taking a couple of swings. Then Stefani chased Douglas to the end of the parking lot. Douglas kept running all the way back to his house to call the police, and Stefani got in his car and left, leaving Denise lying on the ground. Once he'd called the police, Douglas went back to the parking lot to help Denise out. When the police showed up, she told them her name was Mary Gross because she was afraid to tell them her real name since she had a warrant out, apparently for not showing up to the workhouse in Minneapolis as she was her required to by a condition of her probation, which she was on because she'd been convicted for aggravated forgery. She also lied to the police about how she'd come to be in Stefani's company, since obviously prostitution is illegal and she'd been caught by the cops for it before. So she told them that she'd been hitchhiking to a party in White Bear Lake, and Stefani had picked her up, then pulled over, made sexual advances on her, and had stabbed her when she resisted. Police took her to the hospital, and they found that she had 15 stab wounds to her lower right chest, one puncturing her lung, upper right abdomen with one to the liver, and the right side of her head. While all that was happening, Stefani had gone back home, and he ended up calling an ambulance himself, saying, quote, I need an ambulance. I'm all caught up. I got beat up and I'm bleeding. They brought him to the hospital and treated him for cuts to the head, hand, and cheek, and a nose injury. Police were pretty shocked to find out that he'd called an ambulance, saying, quote, Somebody that's wanted generally doesn't call the authorities for help, but I think because of the emergency situation, he had no choice, according to Detective Brown. Police showed uh, Denise mugshots, and she pointed out Stefani. A few days later, Denise told the police her real name, but kept up the story about hitchhiking. Just before the trial, about two years later, though, Denise told the prosecutor she had lied about hitchhiking and had actually gone to Stefani's apartment the night of the stabbing and had engaged in an act of prostitution with him. The police finally brought him in, and during an interview, Stefani claimed he had been robbed, and that's why he was injured like he was. He'd later try to claim self-defense for what he did to Denise, but obviously that's BS. When Detective Brown brought out the weepy-voiced killer case file, complete with pictures of the victims, and showed it to Stefani, he, quote, got up from his seat and said, You're not going to pin those on me. And his voice immediately changed. He went to a high pitch. Right away it struck me as the voice that I had heard on the recordings. Stefani was charged with the assault of Denise and murder of Simmons, and he pled not guilty. Quote, We believe that Paul Stefani had killed Kimberly Compton and assaulted Karen Botak, but we didn't have the evidence, said Tom Foley from the Ramsey from the Ramsey County Attorney's Office. While investigating his background, Detective Brown learned Stefani previously had a girlfriend who ended up returning to her home country of Syria for an arranged marriage. Quote, this upset Stefani very much. When Stefani was attacking his victims, I believe he was attacking his former girlfriend because he felt so betrayed by what she did to him. At the trial, Denise testified about the events, and she admitted that she had lied about hitchhiking. She also admitted that she had lied in the past and often gave false names when arrested. Her history of prostitution arrests and her involvement with petty theft incidents were also brought up on cross-examination. Stefani was convicted of attempted murder in the second degree for attacking uh, Denise, and of assault on the second degree for attacking Douglas Panning. He was sentenced to an executed sentence of 18 years, double the presumptive sentence, and to a consecutive executed sentence of 21 months for the assault. For Barbara Simmons, he was convicted of murder and got 40 years. During his trial, the prosecution called Stefani's sister to the stand and had her listen to a recording of the weepy voice killer, and she identified the person as her brother. His 
sounded like him too, but even with that, there wasn't enough evidence to connect him to the other murders. In 1997, he was diagnosed with terminal skin cancer and given only a year to live. Knowing that he was going to die, Stefani decided to confess to the other murders and apologize to the families of his victims, telling the Star Tribune in December of that year, quote, Since I've been locked down the last 15 years, I've wondered how all this could happen. And all I can say is I'm sick and I'm sorry, if sorry means anything after 15 years. The only thing he asked for in return for his testimony was a picture of his mother's headstone. He admitted to the assault of Karen Potak and the murder of Kimberly Compton, which the police had suspected him for, but also told them about another woman he'd killed, though all he remembered was that he'd drowned her in a bathtub. Quote, we went to the Ramsey County Medical Examiner's Office and researched freshwater drownings in the time frame that he was talking about, said St. Paul Police Department Officer Keith Mortensen. After days of searching, they found a case they thought was a match to Stefani's victim, Kathleen Greening, the 33-year-old teacher who was found dead in her bathtub on July 21, 1982. Paul Stefani had details that only the killer knew. He had specifics about the victim's apartment. It was reported on TV. When the police looked through Greening's address book, they found Paul S. along with his phone number. She was Stefani's third murder victim, but it wasn't known why he didn't call in her murder like he had the others. My personal theory is that since it wasn't as brutal as the other murders, maybe he didn't feel guilty about it like he had with the others. Since maybe in the first place he didn't get as worked up about whatever caused him to murder her as he did with the other women. So, correspondingly, he didn't feel as guilty afterward either. In interviews with the media after his confession, he didn't give any insight into his motivations for killing the women that he'd killed, but he did say there was a voice in his head that told him, Paul, it's time to kill. He also said that after one of the murders, he went to a Catholic church and sat in the back of the pew and cried. Quote, Mother always told if something hurts you, go to God. Quote, to this day, I can't believe it, Stefani said of the murders he committed. I wake up in the morning thinking and hoping I'm dreaming all this. I don't know what to do except to say I wish I could turn back the clock. A year later, on June 12, 1998, yeah, Stefani died inside the Oak Park Heights Maximum Security Prison Infirmary. So this case was covered by a good amount of podcasts. One of them was Case File True Crime Podcast on April 16th, 2016 in an episode called and in an episode called Seeing Red of Murder Calls on January 15th, 2017. Stefani's crimes were then reported during episode 102 titled Quantum Madness and an Abundance of Icicles of the podcast and that's why we drink on January 13th, 2019. The case was also covered in an episode called Rough Winds and High Waters on the podcast My Favorite Murder on May 23rd, 2019, and in an episode of Morbid, a True Crime podcast on January 9th, 2021. The show Mark of the Killer featured the case on its seventh episode called Killer Caller. This case was also covered by Serial Like, no, 
on Japanese true crime cases like American ones, but probably ones from other countries as well. Um, I'll probably still do a lot of Japanese ones since it's kind of like my thing, but, um, yeah. So, sorry this video was a little shorter than usual. Like I said in the beginning, 